The endless horizon behind me could be any of the world's oceans, the Atlantic or the Pacific. But it's not just any ocean. It's North Carolina's other ocean, the Pamlico Sound. And that's our story today on exploring North Carolina. In 1524, barely three decades after Columbus planted the Spanish flag in the West Indies, Giovanni de Verrazzano looked at the Pamlico Sound and was convinced that he had found the Oriental Sea, the other ocean that would take explorers and merchants to India and China. De Verrazzano's Oriental Sea and the outer banks that he saw almost 500 years ago were different from those of today. Exploring North Carolina had the privilege of visiting with Dr. Stanley Riggs, distinguished professor of geology at East Carolina University. He is one of this nation's foremost experts on coastal geology. I asked Stanley Riggs to describe the Pamlico Sound in the age of discovery. Our barrier islands haven't always been there. They've come and gone numerous times. In fact, if you'd been with the, the Vikings in Greenland and Newfoundland around the 900s and 1000 AD, period of time and you'd taken a trip further south, you would not have seen a barrier island, outer banks, as extensive as we have today. And in fact, if you'd been with Columbus and sailed north when he got to this coast, you would have found a broken set of barriers and maybe even an open marine system occupying Pamlico Sound here. It would have been Pamlico Bay at that time. I asked Stan Riggs about the climatic and geological forces that have created the Pamlico Sound and the Outer Banks. We live in what's called the Ice Ages. The Ice Ages are a unique period of geologic time when the climate has been extremely fluctuating in conditions from very cold uh, climates, which we form these glacial ice masses to very warm climates, which are the interglacial ice masses. And these changes have been taking place periodically on a regular basis for the last two million years. And we've had probably as many as 10 to 20 glacial episodes and interglacial episodes during this time. Now, the ice comes down across northern North America and this ice mass was up to two miles thick. And the only source for that much water on land is in the oceans. So we evaporate the water out of the oceans. It's a cold climate. It precipitates as snow on the land and accumulates to form these tremendous ice masses. The consequence to the oceans is that the ocean worldwide drops in, in level so that it's down to during the maximum period when the glacial ice masses existed about 18 to 20,000 years ago, the last time, the sea level was 400 to 425 feet below present. And you can ask, well, how do we know that? Off of North Carolina, there's an erosional scarp in the shoreline there where the ocean eroded a, a cliff out there. And so, if you wanted to go to the beach during that glacial period, which was 18 to 20,000 years ago, and you lived here in North Carolina, which wouldn't have been a nice place to live, by the way. It would have been pretty cold. The ice mass was just several hundreds of miles north of us. And if you, but if you wanted to go to the beach, you'd have to go another 60 miles east of where you are, where the shoreline is today. And the state of North Carolina would have been significantly bigger than it is today. The coastal plain would have been twice as big as it is. The con what is our continental shelf today was exposed. It had rivers running across it. It had topography. It had a few trees, spruce trees, fir trees from the boreal forests out there. I wanted to know how Stan Riggs and his colleagues can locate ancient coastlines. And we know this because we drill holes all over in this system and we get cores of this and we get cores in the base of the peat deposits that have these sp spruce and fir trees in them, the boreal forest trees, and we can age date those trees and so we know again 
what the climate was like 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago. If the coastline was miles to the east at the end of the last ice age, I asked Riggs when the Pamlico Sound we know today filled with water. The ice melted, the water flowed back into the ocean, and sea level started to come up. And as sea level comes up, you got the land surface here, you got your ocean surface here, and as you raise sea level in the ocean, you drowned the coastal plain of North Carolina. You're, you're moving upward and landward with your beach. Your beach follows the edge of the shore. And it rises. We flood up the river valleys. And as we flood up the river valleys, the Tar River here becomes the Pamlico River estuary. The Roanoke River becomes Albemarle Sound as we continue to raise sea level and drown this lower valley here. The Noose River estuary be drowns up the Noose River to the New Bern, and from New Bern West you have a river now, but east of New Bern you have an estuary because that's where sea level is today, right now. The rise and fall of sea level during the various ice ages have caused constant change in the coastal plain, change that can be seen in ancient shorelines that are clearly visible today. The shoreline, at 125,000 years ago, the last time we were in an interglacial that was a little bit warmer than it is today, the ocean was occupied this shoreline right here. That white line that you see from space on this satellite image is an old barrier island comes down here behind Edenton, crosses over here at Plymouth where there's a double barrier island, comes down the Minnesota Beach, down here to the Noose River, comes down through Newport, down here to, forms a, fall, a Cape Lookout, Harker's Island, Beaufort, Moorhead, sit right on the axis of this old barrier island that comes down here and runs through Camp Lejeune down here to Hampstead at Highway 17, and finally to Wilmington. One of the most graphic examples of the Suffolk Scarp, or Suffolk Shoreline, can be seen two miles west of Plymouth, North Carolina, on Highway 64. The old shoreline appears as two large hills in an otherwise flat countryside. As Stan Rigg showed me the evidence of Ice Age climate changes over the last one and a half to two million years, I could not help but remember an earlier trip to Aurora on the Pamlico Sound, when we looked at the ancient sea that had existed here between two and six million years ago. Then, giant whales and sharks fed in a nutrient-rich ocean complete with coral reefs. How fickle is the Earth's climate when viewed over several million years? But before we digress too much, let us come back to the Pamlico Sound as it exists today. We'll never know the feelings of the first explorers on our shores in the age of discovery, but we can experience this unique body of water for ourselves. Perhaps the best way to see the Pamlico Sound is by taking a ferry between the mainland and Cedar Island. All crew members know the sound well. We're going to talk to the captain. I visited with Donald Alston, captain of a sound class ferry for the ferry division of the North Carolina Department of Transportation. I asked the captain how the Pamlico Sound is different from the ocean. Pamlico Sound is uh, a lot different in the Atlantic Ocean. It's very hard to navigate in because the average depth is probably five to 25 foot deep. The waves and swells are different into the uh, Pamlico Sound as versus the ocean. Uh, the Pamlico Sound, the swells are real close together and the oceans are, are pretty far apart. Large uh, ocean going ships, they cannot navigate in the Pamlico Sound. They require more draft. Since ferries are very large boats, I asked Captain Austin how they operate on the Pamlico. The ferries, uh, the sign class ferries, they average about, draw about six foot. Even though in the shallow draft vessels, 
you have to keep look out for the sandbars in the navigable channel waters because they keep shifting in some spots all year long. Captain Austin had some advice for small boat owners unfamiliar with waters of the Pamlico. Even the smallest boat can run aground uh, in the Pamlico Sound you know, when it gets rough or it, as far as that goes, not even being rough. Slick cam, you know. You can run aground with the smallest of the boat. The Pamlico Sound area has been home to Native Americans for perhaps 12,000 years. North Carolina's first town, Bath, was established on the Sound in 1705. Towns like Edenton, Newburn, and Washington were also established in the area in the 1700s. None became a major port like Norfolk or Charleston because they lacked deep water. The rich soils of the coastal plain, however, provided timber, pitch, and rich soil for farming. The low-lying Albemarle Peninsula, with its shallow lakes, was also home to vast numbers of wintering waterfowl. Perhaps most important to the early towns was the dynamic marine ecosystem that surrounded them. Trish Murphy, a biologist for the North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries, knows the ecological importance of the Pamlico and adjoining waters. Pamlico Sound is a unique ecosystem and that provides a, a diverse range of habitats. It's ringed by uh, salt marsh, Spotina marsh. Uh, we have seagrass beds on the uh, bank side. We have um, soft bottom muddy habitat up in our rivers. It also we also have uh, freshwater grasses, um, oyster rocks, um, and also uh, the, the water column provides an important habitat. Pamlico Sound's a huge body of water. It's about 70 miles long from north to south. Um, it's shallow in that it's average depth about 13 feet. It uh, has a wide salinity range from um, ocean salinities uh, around the inlets up to our brackish uh, lower salinities up into the rivers. Another thing that's unique about Pamlico Sound is that right offshore we have currents that converge uh, the, the Gulf Stream coming up from the south and the Labrador that comes down from the north. And at this convergence we have a wide diversity of, of fish from the north and from the south that uh, come and use our, our sound as a nursery area. The sounds are important to such southern species as tarpon and red drum, and to northern species like striped bass. It is a nursery area for many other fish, including sea trout and flounder. Pamlico Sound is also important economically. Uh, half of our shrimp landings come from Pamlico Sound and the surrounding uh, areas, as well as the majority of our blue crabs are landed from Pamlico Sound. To help maintain the Pamlico's water quality and productivity, Trish and biologists for marine fisheries have begun constructing oyster sanctuaries in many parts of the Sound as part of the Division of Marine Fisheries Shellfish Management Program. Mounds of limestone riprap, three to four feet high, with various spacings, are now providing habitat for oysters and finfish. Although North Carolina claims Pamlico Sound as its own, it's also a national treasure in that it provides habitat for all the fish that utilize our eastern seaboard from Maine all the way down to Florida. Eugene Balance of Ocracoke has collected many early maps of the Pamlico dating from the late 1500s through the 1800s. These maps were important for a variety of reasons. Well, the first charts we have of the Outer Banks come from the Sir Walter Raleigh expedition. But what they were interested in with these charts was being able to after they established the colony, come back to the same place from all that distance with their primitive instruments. Well, the next uh, accurate map is from the 1680s and it was produced by William Hatt. And it was actually the first map 
where it's uh, stated that this was North Carolina instead of the Carolinas. In the first maps we have that uh, not only help the ships get in the inlet, but actually navigate down the signs. Uh, Pamlico sign, Albemarle sign, was produced by John Price in 1795. Balance also showed me a number of other maps drawn for navigating the shallow waters and changing channels of the Pamlico. So from the late 1500s to the 1800s, even with those few maps that we have, we can see changes occur along the coast. Inlets would open and close, maybe in the same area by a different name, but uh, uh, the only thing that's constant was the change. Like Stan Riggs' work with coastal geology, Eugene Balance's maps also document change. Maps are a snapshot in time, and Balance's maps show change over four centuries. I asked Stan Riggs about the forces that continue to shape and change our Outer Banks today. We have the rivering system that's coming down off the land, draining the upland areas here, carrying water back to the ocean. Now, the barrier islands sit out here as a sand dam in front of this of these rivers that are flowing off of the state of North Carolina here. And as they flow down in here into the estuary, if this was a solid sand dam here, this would fill up like a bathtub. But it's not a solid dam. It's a broken dam, and the breaks in there are these things that we call inlets. But they're not really inlets. Their main function in life is as an outlet. Their main function is to let this fresh water back out into the ocean. Now, sea level is rising, and this barrier island is sitting there superimposed on top of an inner stream divide between the old Pamlico Creek drainage and the Atlantic offshore drainage that was out here. Pamlico Creek came down, flowed th through the village of Ocracoke like this. This is a valley. And it rose to the inner stream divide, and this sand dam is perched on top of this inner stream divide. And the old inlets, like Ocracoke Inlet, occupies the old Tar River Valley. And Ocracoke Inlet is a fairly stable inlet. It's been open since the colonists were here, and it doesn't move very much, and it's locked in because it's in that old valley. Other types of inlets are much more ephemeral. They come and go. They come and go depending on where the storms are and how, where we have to let the water out. And in fact, that's all they are, is self-adjusting safety valves. We get a big storm, we pile the water up there, they open up, let the water out, and then they close back down. And these things go like this through time. They open here, close down, open here, close down. And in fact, there, if we get the right climatic conditions and a rising sea level, there are times when these barrier islands haven't even been there. But that period from 1000 A.D. to 1500 A.D. was a time when this Pamlico Sound was probably more like Pamlico Bay. It had very large openings, many, many, many inlets, big inlets, that allowed salt water and marine waters to come into and invade this Pamlico Bay, much like Delaware Bay is today. I asked Stan Riggs what factors determine which areas of our outer banks are more prone to overwash during storms and rising sea levels? And this whole system is controlled by its inheritance. What it's inherited is its paleotopography. That's the first variable. The second variable is you got to have sand supply. When the ocean comes in contact with the land, you got wave energy, big energy out here on the ocean. And you will build a shoreline everywhere you have the ocean intersecting the land. We happen to have a very, very, very low slope to our land surface here. So you raise sea level, and this paleotopography then becomes really important in this system. And the wave energy, if you have sand available, your wave energy is going to pile that into a, into a pile of sand. And you can see there's a lot of sand here. This is a wide part of the island here with Kitty Hawk, Nags Head Woods, Collington Island, 
down here. But as you go south, away from here, it gets less and less sand. In fact, this is a sand poor area down here. Then you get down here to Buxton, and you get another big pile of sand. You got to have a source for that sand, and the source here is Diamond Shoals. Diamond Shoals has built this beach. The source for this sand is the old Roanoke River Delta that was dumped out here. So that sand is the sand that then is reworked and built into this this beach, this barrier island system, and it's built in there on the top of this ridge. Now, if we were to raise sea level a little bit higher, what's going to happen to that ridge? We can see in recent decades locations where new inlets have formed, this one in 1962 and another in 2003. Both were closed to maintain an existing road system. In sand-starved areas, it will not always be possible to maintain the outer banks in a static, unchanging form to serve our needs. History has shown us that nature will continue to sculpt the outer banks by forces beyond our control. Uh, this is a serious problem that we have to deal with. If we want to maintain that resource for the future, we've got to start to let the island work. It's got to work. It's got to be able to flex its muscles. It's got to be able to change with the flow. The important thing that we have to remember is that these islands are built by storms. They require storms for their health and for their long-term evolution and survival. They are storm-dominated systems. It's not the barrier island that's fragile. It's the superstructure, the human superstructure on top of the barrier island that's fragile. Those barrier islands have been there a long time. They've come and gone. As the climates have changed, as the sea levels changed, they'll be there for a long time in the future. What we want to make sure is that we're partners in this and, and not just uh, an archaeological remnant. Having seen the Pamlico Sound through the eyes of some of the people who know it best, we hope you have a better appreciation for this magnificent resource. Join us again soon for another adventure on exploring North Carolina.